Um, my name's Mark Dorling, and um, I'm a teacher at Bangor Grammar School. Um, and I'm also the teacher who's responsible and has the privilege of working in the digital schoolhouse uh, two days a week. As Dave um, explained earlier, in the summer of 2008, with the support of the Computer Associates trustees, we moved the digital schoolhouse from Disson Park down the road into um, Langley Grammar School. So um, the contents of the presentation today is really the story so far, uh, what we do and who we do it for, um, why computing, our partnerships both internally within the school with other departments and externally, and also um, looking at sustainability of the project in terms of how do we impact in schools locally long term, and then also uh, a network proposal we're currently working on, and then finally the uh, benefits to Langley Grammar School. So, the um, Digital Schoolhouse is a transition project for Key Stage uh, 2 pupils, primarily in years 5 and 6, from local primary schools and some SEN schools, both primary and secondary, so that includes um, EBD schools, etc., to visit for a day of specialist ICT and now computing teaching in a dedicated environment aimed at primary school pupils. As I say, I'm the teacher who's responsible and gets the privilege of working with these schools two days a week. And I have a day which we call my stuff day, which is um, filled up with lots of projects and initiatives. And um, in the two days a week, we open from 10 until 2.30. Those times are adjusted uh, according to the school's needs. So if they're a bit further away, then we can obviously start, start a bit later and finish a bit earlier. If they're just around the corner, then they come a bit earlier and leave a bit later. Since uh, December 2008, we've had over 55 schools visit. That's over 125 visits and approximately 4,000 plus pupils have come here from local schools. The aim of the project is to accelerate pupils' learning in new skills and concepts to focus on how they are employed not only in secondary school, but also in the world of work and business. I'm very fortunate that I'm a primary trained teacher who teaches in secondary school I also have industry experience working in IT and computing. Once the uh, consolidation of the key skills has taken place, so we revisit learning that children should have had between, say, years three and five, we then um, accelerate that learning to cover things that they could learn in key stage three, four, and even occasionally key stage five with some of the new computing content that we cover. So um, the ICT lessons, was the, was the initial focus. However, like others, including the government, we are now looking and realising that computing is the way forward. So to put that into context, um, if you think about a child who joins school this September, how many versions of Word, Excel, Office, etc. will they learn before they leave at the age of 18? My best, get, um, best guess from being in education six or seven years now is about six. Well, that's not really acceptable especially as we're trying to prepare them for technologies and environments and workplaces that yet don't exist. So you're probably thinking, well, what's the difference between ICT and computing? I think the easiest way to describe it is to say that ICT is like driving the car, whereas computing is like designing the car. And if we expect our children to be independent learners, and more importantly, evaluators, critiquers of technology, then it is imperative that they understand the key skills and you know, the concepts behind these technologies. It is often said that computing is the silent C in STEM. Well, we believe at Langley Grammar School, as others do, that computing should be given equal status. And in the Digital Schoolhouse project, we've included a second C. The second C is creativity. So we now say creativity and computing are the silent Cs in STEM. So, in response to the changes, um, suggested changes to national curriculum in 2009 in the Rose Report, the Digital Schoolhouse decided, with feedback from local primary and secondary schools, that we would move to the creative curriculum model of teaching. So, therefore, we decided that we would teach ICT discreetly within those lessons and instead focus on the teaching of computing. Our accelerated learning model for uh, teaching Key Stage 2 pupils key stage 3 and key stage 4 content is achieved by challenging their expectations and their perceptions of what they should receive when they walk into an ICT suite. 
So we try, wherever possible, to teach computing concepts without the use of computers, wherever possible. So having them doing kinesthetic learning activities, moving around the room, pretending that they are the computer. This work that we've been doing over the last 18 months has been shared with a group or a national teaching body called CAS, Computing at School. I don't know if a few of you have heard of them. And this feedback has gone into their writing of their new curriculum for computing, because obviously one doesn't exist at the moment for Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. Since this feedback process has taken place, they've actually tasked the Digital Schoolhouse with others, like Miles Berry from uh, Roehampton University and, and various other people, to write a computing curriculum for primary schools. So identifying the good stuff that's already in Key Stage 1 and 2, because really Key Stage 1 is about as good as it gets for computer control, and looking at how do we bridge the gap between Key Stage 1, which we think is good, and this new Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4 curriculum. So this I'm just going through. Now, there is a great deal that we can learn by working with um, colleagues, both inside school and outside school. So, for example, we have a number of departments in this school that have collaborated with the Digital Schoolhouse Project to develop lessons for Key Stage 2 pupils. For example, the DT department have created two CAD CAM lessons based on sustainability. The English department have a creative lesson with us on creative writing using a programming tool called Scratch. The Modern Foreign Languages department have developed um, one lesson using ProBots, which navigate the old floor turtles that navigate around environments and you control them using the screen, but with um, four modern languages. Four modern languages, so I think that's Italian, German, French, and Spanish. Now, why do we do that? Well, they say the best age to teach children a modern language is before the age of 11. And computing and programming, the structure is like a language. So why not combine the two? And we found that actually the children get it. So we move them around the room, following flow diagrams, tending their robots. And once we've done it in English, we then do it in the modern foreign language. And then when they're using the computers and they're programming their instructions in forwards, backwards, left, right, we again focus in on using the foreign language rather than using the English. So using the IT as the hook, really. We have a lesson uh, which is currently trialling on, and we like to joke, it's making algebra sexy and relevant. So we combine that with uh, Simon variables in computing. And um, the children create a calculator um, which does four operations, add, divide, minus and multiply as well as the CE button for resetting the calculator. And they designed this for Key Stage two, uh, key stage 1 children to use as like a homework tool. And then finally, we've been working with our ICT department to develop a computing lesson on how does the internet actually work. So not um, creating lessons whereby the children search the internet, but actually looking how does the internet work behind it. How does, how does a message flow through the internet? How does a search engine actually work? And um, that's just a few of the internal collaborations. Externally, we've been working with organisations such as the Royal Holloway University and an uh, animal centric project called the Jungle Fortress to develop a database lesson based on science and literacy. We've been working with Computing at School and Hampton Court Palace uh, to use their maze to teach logic and problem solving, so navigating an unfamiliar environment using a right hand wall, uh, uh, right -hand wall follower scenario. And that's where we can include the Key Stage 5 work, because you can teach children decision points and nodes, which come up in the A-level curriculum for computing. Something very simple, so it's not what you're selling, it's how you sell it. We've been working with um, p5c.com and Dialogueworks on a philosophy for computing lesson. And why is that relevant? Well, next year in September, some of the Red Brick universities are launching philosophy computing degrees now, so including Oxford. And um, I'm excited to announce, um, actually in the last couple of weeks, that we have now just agreed a collaboration with BlackBerry and with uh, Queen Mary University of London on a new human-computer interaction lesson based on mobile phones, which we're hoping to launch after Christmas. So we've got lots of collaborations already in the pipeline, already working on, already completed. There are many more in the pipeline, both nationally and internationally which I'm afraid I can't tell you about today because we haven't had permission to, to talk about it. 
But what I'd like to do now is just give you an example of a lesson that's um, on the board. Um, the lesson you're, you're looking at is our new creative writing lesson. And that was developed with our English department, with Zenobia, who was mentioned earlier. And the aim of the lesson is to engage children in writing, children who don't like writing. Why did we do this was because um, local primary schools were saying to us, creative writing is one of our objectives, one of the things we have to improve. So what do we do? We give them a fruit or vegetable at the start of the lesson and that acts as a stimuli. And what they do is they turn this fruit or vegetable into a character. So for example, the um, thing that I'm holding there is an onion, I think it is. And that onion became Onionator, who was a divorced male with two children. And that's why when he opened up his feelings, okay, if you peeled back the layers, he made everyone cry because he was so sad. Okay? The children do the same. They create a story based around their fruit or vegetable. Okay? We then develop the computing aspect by getting them to uh, create computer games based on the story. Therefore, we avoid guns and shooting, okay? because well, fruit and vegetables aren't guns. Okay? And the second point is the ICT acts as a hook. Okay? The computing acts as a hook. They can't put something in their game that isn't on the paper and vice versa. Okay, they can't write something on the paper that isn't in the game. So it gets children who maybe are reluctant learners for ICT and computing, who like literacy, to actually do some writing. So it, it works both ways. Now, we've got some feedback from um, staff on this, which I'd like to show you. And this is a comment from a colleague at St Peter's uh, Primary School, where she notes the fact that children who don't usually like writing, or who would normally write just one or two sentences in a whole hour's literacy lesson, sat there and wrote a page in their book, and they, they were stunned by this. But some of the children will come up to me at the end of the lesson, and I always remember a boy that we had a couple of weeks back who walked up to me at the end of the lesson, walked up and he goes, Sam, and I went, yeah, you know, I really like it in our world, everybody knows us there, and he just ran out. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I quite like it in our world as well. But some of the children will also come up to us who are quite literacy able, who enjoy literacy, enjoy creative writing, and they'll come up to me and say, I really enjoyed that lesson because you didn't tell me what to write or how to write it or, or what I had to follow or was I worried about my full stops, capital letters and was the sentence structure correct. You just told me to write and enjoy writing. And then we got to create a game which is very visual based on that writing. Okay. So how do we ensure that this work impacts on the schools long term? You know, 55 schools, it's a lot. Well, we often joke at the start of the lessons that we're looking for a victim, sorry, volunteer, to come out the front and team teach with us. Now, ordinarily, it's the teacher, the class teacher, and they get involved, and by getting them like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll do it, it sort of, it drags the children along, and they get enthusiastic. Sometimes it's the teaching assistant. And what we do is we do a team teach throughout the lesson, so not only am I teaching the children <coughs> and sort of helping them, I'm also prepping the teacher about what's going to happen next, so, for example, my colleague uh, last week had the coconut, and she came up with um, Captain Jack was the coconut, and he liked rum, and obviously had to open himself up to put the coconut into the rum, and all different things. So, it's about getting them involved. And what we do is all the resources for every lesson, all 14 of them or something, are placed on our website under the resources uh, column. So, therefore, teachers can go back to their schools, they can download them, they can use them, Every lesson has independent learning videos. That means videos that as you move um, your mouse around the screen, it records what you do. So that the teachers can either teach the lesson on their own and just use the videos to help them get started. Or they can stand there and just press play and pause. But the important thing is it gives them the confidence to, to actually have a go back at their school. Now how do we know that? Well last year when we um, looked at what schools studied what topics, we found only one school came back and did the same lesson as they had done the previous year. And we asked them, why was that? And they said, well, we now have the confidence to teach that on our own. So we thought we'd do something else. So we know that this model is working. So what else do we do to support local schools? Well, we do lecturing at Bruno University. My colleague, um, Stacey Jenkins, who's an ASD at the school, goes out as well to the, to the schools and to the universities to support. We run twilight training sessions for uh, local schools, which are free. 
we um, chair a local uh, cluster group of schools, which we're actually increasing the numbers this year because it's proved so popular. And we run things like programming competitions and scratch and, and other things, as well as me going out and doing a similar role as Karen does, where I um, support them, look at their school development plan, we look at um, where they are now, where they'd like to be, and what simple steps can we put in place to kind of start moving them towards that way. We also write various educational publications, which we have published in like the uh, Higher Education Academy. And we um, present at conferences about what we're doing. Um, this is all helping to raise the profile of computing in schools, both primary and in secondary. So, um, Langley Grammar School, as we say, is a leading edge school. And we've been um, working with Computing at School and the former head of the TDA, a guy called Tim Tarrant, to develop a CPD model for computing, for teaching teachers computing. Because there aren't any, or there aren't many specialist computing teachers in school. Most schools, if they have one, they're lucky. At this school, we're quite lucky because we have three of us. Um, this proposal is based on using existing ASTs from various subjects, not just maths or ICT, to collaborate with a computing specialist to create resources and deliver training designed for non-specialist teachers. We know that the AST model is one of the most successful initiatives in education in the last 10 years. So what we're trying to do is utilise that, so we're having non-specialist ASTs delivering training for non-specialists. The benefits of this is that there's a skills exchange between the computing specialist and the AST and also utilising ASTs in this new educational environment. Well, you know, the, the money has to come from somewhere. We're currently having this work, or this working draft, reviewed by the TDA, also by the Department of Education and the uh, Schools Network, as well as VITAL, which is kind of the distance learning branch of the government CPD sort of initiative. So if you have an AST or a computing specialist in your school which you think that might be interested in setting up and establishing this network, this leading edge idea, then please come and talk to me either in the break or drop me an email after the session. But you're probably sitting there thinking, well, how does this benefit your school? This is lovely, spending all your time, three days of work outside school, but how does it benefit Langley Grammar School? Well, there's just five students, example of, who are children who came to the digital schoolhouse who are now in my year eight class. Okay, they're just five. There are many, many more. The digital schoolhouse materials are always adapted and scaled up, and they are used in ICT lessons and as extracurricular activities run at lunchtime by a variety of teachers in our department, not just me. This has helped ensure a good uptake at GCSE of the new computing GCSE run by OCR. We have 28 taking it in the first year. And bearing in mind, we've only been really looking at computing in Key Stage 3 for 12 months. That's a really good uptake compared with other schools nationally, if you look at the averages. And there's a growing enthusiasm for students and SLT um, for computing. 